welcome to this episode of The Midwives' Cauldron. If you haven't listened to part one of this episode, I highly recommend you go back, otherwise you won't have a clue what we're talking about. We mentioned things such as the Paraben account, the Christmas Songs album, and why it took me so long to edit. Plus, we also actually discussed Sphere, or was it fear, of influence, our gifts and relationships with the women we work with. So when we're looking at navigating the system, go back and listen to part one before you continue on with part two. Enjoy the show. I'm Katie James and this is the Midwives Cauldron Podcast. Each episode, I'm joined by my incredible co-host, Dr. Rachel Reed. Listen in as we hubble, bubble, toil and trouble our way through aspects of womanhood, midwifery, birth and lactation. So go on, subscribe now and hear us on your favorite podcast host. And just be really clear about, you know, your roles. And we've had a lot of questions around decision making. Mm. And, you know, how do you give information to women to, you know, support them with informed decision making, um, particularly when it's likely that the evidence doesn't support the hospital policy and the woman then makes a decision yeah. outside the hospital policy or that she makes a decision inside the hospital policy and then ends up with a bad outcome because that isn't evidence-based and it didn't work for her. And I think, mm. you know, we as midwives get really caught into that decision-making and, you know, it, again, it's about what is, what is your sphere of influence? Like I have no influence over the next care provider who says the absolute opposite to me, to the woman or comes in the room at the end of birth and interferes with the birth. You know, I have limited influence over the woman then going along with the thing that the, the person is saying, that's not my stuff. All I can do is go, am I sharing adequate information with this woman mm -hmm. to gain consent and for her to support her decision making and then release attachment to the decisions that she makes? And and that can be really hard. And, and I think even the wording around that, you know, often, you know, student midwives really like, like us to kind of do this role play of, of saying the words that you would say, because it's really difficult because what you often have is, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm just going to do this thing to you or I need to like for example vaginal examinations which are you know su uh, supposed to be offered for hourly in most institutions mm -hmm. even though that's not evidence-based mm -hmm. you know oh yeah we've talked about that previously it's bullshit but it's but it's in the guidelines sometimes in the policy and it's yes. how do you then say to a woman I mean you should be doing this antenatally before she even gets there that because you don't want her to think the institutions you know evil Against and trying them. to mm -hmm. you know it's not the, the intention is is her safety and the baby's safety it's just yeah. that, that it's coming from a particular perspective which is not necessarily evidence-based so I think it's about saying that to women is look you know that this is this hospital that I work in is set up kind of generally for a general population and there are policies and guidelines um for example routine vaginal examination um that you know, as, as a midwife, I'm expected to offer you a vaginal examination because you've been in the hospital for four hours, for example. Um, and that's according to this hospital policy. The policy is not actually based on research evidence. And there's good evidence now to tell us that really doesn't give us a good indication about where you are in your labor. This is physiological birth disclaimer. Um, so it doesn't give us a good indication. We know mm. that now, but these guidelines, you know, they've still, they've still got it in there. Um, there are risks associated with doing a vaginal examination and, you know, all midwives can reel off that list, including be painful and might accidentally rupture your membranes, might cause contractions to become more painful initially afterwards, might find out something that makes you feel, you know, negative about your birth because plant the seed you know. of doubt. So you, you're kind of putting all that in there. Yep. So, you know, you're, you're framing it in that, look, the hospital's got this policy that I have to offer you. Um, there are risks associated with it. Um, you know, some women like to know what their cervix is doing, even though it doesn't mean anything. Um, and then you finish it with, 
what would you like me to do? Because I'll support your decision either way. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you're really placing that decision onto the woman. Most women will say, I'd like to know because they like to follow the policy and they like to know what their cervix is doing because that's such a cultural norm. So you do the vaginal examination mm-hmm. and you've got full consent because she's got the risks, the benefits. She knows that it's not evidence-based, that this is a, a cultural norm in a hospital that she's going along with. Um, and if she says no, great, you write down, offered vaginal examination, discussed risks and benefits, declined, yep. you know, will exactly. re-offer in whenever, two hours, four hours, whatever it is. Um, so you've backed yourself up. And legally and professionally, that you're covered if you do that. Mm, um, exactly. And yes, you might have to deal with people going, none of you women have vaginal examinations. <laughs> but that's not your job. Your job is to give the woman the information. Did you hear that a lot, Rachel? None of your women have vaginal examinations. <laughs> <laughs> well, most actually what I find is most women in hospital, oh, it's about 50-50 when you give them that spiel. It's like um, rupturing membranes, which is, mm. you know, absolutely pretty much pointless, but yep. it's still the norm. Mm. Is, Incredible. you know, despite the fact you tell women that it doesn't actually speed up their labor and that it might include blah, 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 you'll still get women in fact, it's not so much women having their first babies. You know who's a stickler for this is the women who've had babies before and had yeah. their babies really quickly after an ARM. And they go, I just need to rupture my waters, midwife, because yeah. then the baby will come. And you're like, go, the baby's coming and you're doing really well and blah, blah, blah. And I really don't want to do that because your body's working really well. Oh, you need to rupture my membrane. The number of times I've been bullied into rupturing women's membranes and they're going, if you do that, I'll have the baby. I'm like, well, oh. and then you end up going, all right, then. And yep. you rupture the membrane, have a bloody did. baby in 15 minutes, go, see, told yep. you, should have done that an hour ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, yes, I've been there as well. <laughs> and then they're right because they know their body. And, and also, again, that's about choice, isn't it? So informed choice. Yeah. So I think we really need to look at our relationships with women. We need to do more education, not just with midwifery students. I think I think this needs to be a conversation that's had with midwives and doulas need to have these conversations because their relationship, again, is is different in terms, you know, in terms of the mother midwife relationship. The doula midwife relationship is different again. And I think we need a bit more exploration around how can we protect women in that relationship? Because it's not healthy for women Mm. to, you know, attach to their midwife. And how can we protect midwives in that? Lovely. Yep, I would agree. Which brings us on to relationships with colleagues, Katie. Yeah, I mean, this is... this you're much better at than me. In what way? (laughs) Towing the line, being the covert or being the... um... (laughs) I mean, I have said for a while, slowly, slowly, catchy monkey. Yeah, you see, my uh, my gift is not um, diplomacy. And I, I fully own that. Um, I have colleagues who, who, who will actually do that for me because I'm not very good at. See, that's your gift. It's the slowly, yeah. slowly catchy monkey. I just bang the monkey on the head with a mallet, and then yeah, yeah, doesn't help anybody. Yeah, but then I have to take a slower, and I have to wait, and I have to deal with the feelings of frustration because I'm waiting. I'm waiting to get the relationship. I'm, I'm, I am a relationship builder. So the way I work with colleagues, the way I've worked in um uh leadership roles or you know positions of uh I'm going to say positions of power it's not a position of power but I suppose if you're in a manager role or you're in a, a higher up role um in the hospital system sister then so team leader role etc um it can be tricky to navigate and also I found that when I went up a level um, or two levels, I'm then sort of between a rock and a hard place because I'm just under top level management who are bringing mm-hmm. down all these directives. And then I've got one or two levels below me who I meant to bring mm-hmm. these directives in. And I've got my own knowledge base, uh, personal beliefs, personal history, all of that that goes with it. Um, and so I've had to... You're the shit in the shit sandwich. I'm totally, I was the shit for a long time and it is not always pleasant. (laughs) And it's, and I didn't, I actually got put in that position very soon after I moved to Australia. Um, And I was like, what the hell am I doing here? This, it was basically an acting role that I thought would be for a month because um, 
the boss had left head of lactation and I got the role and it ended up being nine months and they kept saying oh you're doing a great job do you want the job permanently and I was like no no I'd been a qualified lactation consultant for like six months I was not ready but that's not the point I, I went on to go on to those roles when I was ready for me relationships are key um I think there are definitely is a need for um, times of bulldozing, but I also think that it's good to be aware of when a slowly, slowly catchy monkey approach works. And that can be for me in a lactation world, it's the navigation between the maternity unit and the neonatal unit. And there may be one door in between them, yet it's like we work on different universes yet we're looking after the mother and the baby dyad and it, we treat them separately. We have almost different policies and this doesn't function well. So the other thing is there was a lot of resistance to the fact that I had this title lactation consultant and people would purposely say, I'll get the lactation nurse for you because they didn't even like the title. So you can imagine trying to change policy when they don't even like the fact that you I'm calling myself a lactation consultant. I'm sorry, that was just that was just a qualification I was given. Like I didn't choose it. It's just what it is. Um, I'm consulting women about their lactation. I'm not trying to be anything bigger, but blah, blah, blah. So when I'm navigating that system- You think system, you're a doctor? Yes, I've had that as well. It's like, you're not a midwife anymore because you're a lactation consultant and you think you're a doctor. So both sides, oh, it's brilliant. Everyone go out and do your IBCLC exam. Great, kidding do it if you want to. It's brilliant. But I would have to navigate change in policy and in both a maternity ward and a neonatal ward. And that is difficult. Um, and so relationship building is paramount. Mm. And also I would have to look at very different ways of communicating that information. One, because not all of us absorb things the same way. I mean, I would go into, uh, like we do an in-service or we're trying to introduce a policy and they would look at me with daggers. Their body language was closed. It was more than closed. Their body language was basically saying, fuck off. I'm not listening to you. Who the hell do you think you are? And we've done it our way and this has always worked. I've had people call out and heckle, literally heckle. I'm not even a comedian on stage. They've heckled what I've said before I've given them the information. And so you've got to have a bit of a strong, strong backbone, but also be open. And so for me, it's utilizing your gifts or your strengths, which is good communication skills, backing it up. Um, also, I would do a variety, like I said, a variety of ways if you're needing to bring in information or you're wanting to change something find those midwives or those colleagues around you who you are supported by who think similarly can't say that word to you and get together and then I think the other thing is to feel like if you've read research and you want to try and change a policy book an appointment with the person who is in charge of the ward um, make it something that you can just say, can we have 20 minutes together? I want to sit down and just talk about some new research. The other thing that you might want to bring up, and it might seem like out of your depth, but also like a um, uh, research review every month or, uh, you know, lunch and learns that you can bring in once a month. And everyone does something different. And you gather a group of like-minded people. And if it becomes fun and it becomes something interesting, then more people join. So it's just thinking differently. It's not always easy, but um, there are many ways to bring in change and um, to deal with difficult complexities that need to be updated. I just wanted to say, and I think when it's, so that's like on the big scale of policy change or practice change on a smaller level it can be that you have been with a colleague and you've heard something really out of date said or you've seen really bad practice and I think for a long time I was very scared about how would I get the right words to speak to that colleague but I think and it would always feel like it's easier to go above or to go and bitch to someone else 
what this ongoing bitching does mm. is it just creates this toxic environment. And actually what I've learned through the years is to just take some massive deep breaths and probably have to run to the toilet beforehand, mm. but then go and speak to that colleague in private, <laughs> sensibly, and hold your yeah. ground. You might want to talk to one person beforehand. And the other thing is practice what you're going to say. Like if you're going to, it's like an interview. If you're going to give a talk or you want to discuss something about change or you need to bring something up, think about it the night before and, and maybe even jot down the words you want to say. This is something I do. It helps me. We're all different. And it just gives you that confidence. But actually, once you've done it the first time, I think it will give you the confidence to do it again. And also it's polite to do it that way. And it makes sure that they keep that respect with you. And I think that another important thing to think about is that you don't. So again, it's about really owning your role and who you are and your mm-hmm. expertise. And, you know, and I guess, you know, having worked in the UK where there's a lot, lot it's a lot easier because there's a real kind of respect between the professions, between obstetrics and midwifery around, you know, whose expertise is where and how that works together, where it's a little bit more difficult. Um well, I found it more difficult in Australia, but just to remember that, you know, you are the expert. If you're a midwife in a hospital setting compared to an obstetrician, you are the expert in normal Mm. because the obstetrician is the expert in high risk and managing problems. And that's when you work together. So just to really own your, your own expertise and all that experience that you've had. Um, And just to remember that, you know, obstetricians aren't researchers, Mm. They're clinicians. Mm -hmm. So they haven't studied research. You know, um, I've worked with some obstetricians on research projects. There are obstetricians who are working towards their PhDs, but that's not their area. So, you know, don't, don't, um, you know, think that just because there's an obstetrician that they will know what the best level research is. And there's times when I've kind of talked to obstetricians that, oh, well, you know, there's a Cochrane review that says blah, 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 blah. And they're actually like genuinely is there. When I study, when you know, last time I looked, it was this thing. Hang on, let me have a look at that Cochrane review. Oh, okay, that's interesting. That's something that wow. I didn't know about. So, you know, don't own your own expertise. And also you don't mm. have to give, you know, I say this to w- women all the time when they contact me and ask me to give them research so they can argue to make the decision that they want to make. Because you, you do not own, you do not owe anybody an explanation for, you know, what, what your decisions are as a woman and as a midwife, you don't, you don't need to ingratiate yourself with medicine. It's really nice if you get that respect from medicine and if you can work to get it and build relationships. But if you don't get it, you don't, ha- it's not your job to be, you know, ingratiate yourself with medicine. It's not like, mm. what's the point in trying to get an, an obstetrician who's going to think you're a witch, whatever you do <laughs> to like you by <laughs> trying to say, look, I can also be medical. I can, you know, I'm a midwife. Look, I'm learning how to do ultrasound. So I'm like you, please like me. I don't actually care if you, I can't do an ultrasound. You can do that because you're an obstetrician. But you know what? I know far more about supporting physiology than you'll know as an obstetrician. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it just drives me nuts when you see midwives go, can you give me all this research to prove that it's all right to not do this thing to the woman when the obstetrician wants to do the thing to the woman even though the woman doesn't want the obstetrician to and the obstetrician has no research to support the thing they want to do to the woman like no just say no just if the woman doesn't want it she says no and you say as a midwife I'm supporting the woman to say no end of story you see I'm not obviously a a monkey monkey slowly slowly (laughs) no I mean and also I think it is difficult in that situation like at the time that's that can be great. But also if you want to try and you are the person who's like, no, I'm going to try and make change, or you are at that position to make change, you do need to have the research and you do need to have those skills to be able to sit and talk to doctors as well. And sometimes that can be really fear uh, fear inducing. But also if those obstetricians or whoever team leaders or whatever are not open to listening to you, then that's, you know, that that you can't control that. And I've had some really good success in the, in the UK with, um, arguing the point around the length of you know as they were calling it second stage which you know there are no stages to labor but that's a whole other podcast and a rant Mm -hmm. um around the time frames in a particular hospital with the second stage of labor and you know me pointing out that there wasn't any research evidence and you know the women i looked after kind of went right past the guidelines all the time 
And the obstetricians were really open to, okay, well, look, if there's no evidence, let's maybe we could look at that. And we got together a multidisciplinary team and everybody went off and did a literature review on little bits of, you know, evidence around, you know, bladders and whatever they were interested in around second stage of labor Mm -hmm. and came together and created a, you know, a a new policy to trial, um, which then happened just as I was leaving to go to Australia so I didn't get involved in the implementation of that but that was the I know it's a shame really it would have been good but so there is change can happen if you just keep raising an issue and do it in a way of look there there isn't any evidence why are we doing this thing there isn't any evidence I wonder what would happen if we did this other thing because there's a bit of evidence to support that and it's about you know treating people with respect I mean I know I'm saying I go go (laughs) with mallets I actually don't I do (laughs) I, I just don't suffer for, if people are rude to me I just can't be bothered to then try and make them like me because I haven't got the energy for that if you're not going to meet me with some respect and we can have some collegial disagreement then no but you have made changes in your career and you have you have played the polite game I mean you can talk with people and you can discuss yeah and I always find humor works quite well in getting people on your side if you can kind of laugh at what you've done of course. That's why we're doing this podcast, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm just remembering me drawing a little diagram. I used to draw diagram When my, when my um, cases went to risk management, which every morning. Every morning a case went to risk management? No, no. Every morning they have a risk management review of all the cases in the last 24 hours that met certain criteria. Yeah, well, mine were quite often in there because it was things like prolonged um, second stage and all this like stuff, which was actually just like not really a risk management. It was normal. So I often ended up with my cases going to risk management in the mornings. And it was just a joke. I would just t- you know, I'd turn up if I was still on shift, if I was on shift the next day, because it would be my case. And the, it would just be, you know, the obstetrician would go, okay, this is another one of yours. So I started drawing them diagrams of things, you know, like just to explain what had happened. <laughs> Like, like the time that I missed a baby, that that went to risk management with a woman what who. What do you was... mean you missed a baby? No, um, did, I've missed it. Well, it wasn't just me; it was also the other person who was supposed to be catching the baby, which was her mother or her mother-in-law. I can't remember. So she was on all fours, and this baby just kind of went from not even crown to next contraction, out between yep. her legs, which One is what would happen in nature. Yeah. So then the baby was like screamed because it was like, wah! And yeah. then everyone in the room just burst out laughing. And the mother s- said to her, the mother-in-law, her mother, you should have caught the baby. And, you know, the mother-in-law pointed at me and said, you should have caught the baby. And I'm like, you know, so we're just Ooh. laughing. It was funny. Yeah. Anyway, I came out of the, I came out of the room I was late after the placenta was out and all that, you know, and you just put the placenta on the trolley and then off you went oh, yes. and then you would go past the desk and you'd say time of birth and then yeah. Yeah, tick. So I went past the desk and the, and the team, team leader said, what was all that raucous laughter in your room? And I should have just left it at that. And I went, oh, oh no, <laughs> it's all right. We just missed the baby and it like fell out and she's like, what? Anyway, the next thing we've got pediatricians checking the baby over. There's a risk management form. So I drew a diagram and I actually estimated the, the height of the fall and the, the, the fact the baby rotated and landed on its back. Wow. <laughs> so they had a full diagram. and Love a diagram. Even more yeah. so now. I've never seen that in diagram form. I wish you still had it. Could you draw it again for us so I can put it on um, Instagram? Brilliant. <laughs> to scale. <laughs> to scale. <laughs> I'll have to try and do those things when they, oh God knows. Anyway, you can print it out, viewers. And um... <laughs> we could sell a limited edition for our, for our Paraben accounts to get our microphones and things. Brilliant. I was also thinking last night, we should have the squidge picture, squidge and sponge on a t-shirt. I mean, who wouldn't want that? We can we also should. have your diagram of uh, missing babies. <laughs> Our funding's just going rocketing up. It's brilliant. I know. We'll be millionaires this time we'll next be millionaires. year. Millionaires. Brilliant. Yeah. So relationships, a bit of humor helps. Even if you just find it funny, nobody else finds it funny. I always find that that's helpful. Can you shut your door? I think the cigars <laughs> are going crazy. Well, I can't really because the door is shut. Oh, okay. Well, then there's it's nothing I can do. Bloody well. hell, they're loud. It's Queensland, man. Hey, it's, I'm sorry, listeners, for you this noise. You the bird going off as well. Yeah, I did hear the bird earlier. But the, the cicadas just I'm in a jungle. Like... Am I in a jungle? Oh, just... You're in a jungle. There's a song about that. I'm in a jungle, you know, uh-huh, uh-huh, from Getting Under. Isn't there? 
Here we go. Oh, now that's going to do my head in. Here we go. No, that one I don't know. I can't even relate. Oh. We're in the jungle. We're in the right, jungle I'm now. Right, I'm going to find it on YouTube or something. Brilliant. It's, it's like a jungle, you know. It's a rap song. Oh, it's, it's like, like a it's rap song. getting down in the jungle, you know. Anyway, we'll put that on the Christmas album. <laughs> It's like a jungle sometimes. Do, do, do. You keep you wonder what you know that's a key number. Da, ba, da, ba, da, ba, da, ba. It's a jungle sometimes. You know da, 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 da. See? It's a song. It is a song. Right. It's a song, isn't it? It's on the really? Christmas album. Are you impressed? <laughs> right, moving on. What have we got next? Oh, go on, Katie. Self-care. Ugh. Self-care is the next thing on the list. I know it is, but it's just I loved your reaction. Go on, Rachel, why don't you start? The next one we're going to talk about on the list is self-care, which um, I put down. And mm. do you know what? I'm actually going to read out the bullet point for you because the bullet point says, why <laughs> Rachel Reed gets annoyed by the concept of resilience. Katie James is interested by this one. <laughs> so go on, Rachel. You can tell me. And all the listeners, why oh, you get annoyed my. by the concept of resilience. All right, you ready? I'm all ready. not a song. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> so I just get a bit pissed off at the idea that we need to be doing all these nice things to ourselves so that we can be resilient, so that we can then work in systems that, systems that fuck us over and, you know, systems that abuse women. We need to do self-care to ourselves so we can be resilient to working in them. How about we do self-care so that we're ready to, can you hear Eddie going off? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's Eddie roosting. He's agreeing with me. Eddie is the peacock, just so people are aware <laughs> in case I can't cut this out. So cicadas and the peacock um, in the background. It's a jungle, you know, sometimes it stops you from getting under. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Get on with it. Stop avoiding the question. I'm not avoiding the question. Right. So I don't think if we're going to be building resilience, I think we need to be self-caring to build not resilience, but to build revolution. We need to be strong to change stuff, not to just deal with stuff. So that's what annoys me. That's actually brilliant. That is brilliant. And I completely, completely agree with you. It it brings me to right. the the talk, the, you know, the conversations that are happening now and have been happening for a while, but really are out at the moment and looking at how, you know, we've directed our discourse to women and young girls about the rape culture of keep yourself safe. Yep. Don't wear this. And yep. so it's, it's, I'm not saying that's resilience, but it's similar in that way of the blame, Victim so to blaming. speak. It's, yeah. It's, it's in the wrong direction. And I completely agree with you in terms of that. For me, resilience looks at how I can keep myself strong so that I can continue to be strong within my job. But yeah, yeah, that's just really made me think of that in a different way as well. That's fabulous. And it's just interesting because recently there's been a lot of stuff on self-care, particularly for midwives. Not so much maybe this year, but thanks to covid everything's about that but before that there was a lot of like mm. self-care workshops and you know yeah education things see them. around self-care for midwives which is great but you know hang on are we asking us why are you do why are we doing jobs where we have to do self-care yeah. to maintain our mental health in those jobs how about you know we look at dismantling the Pressure off I go now we're gonna get into the patriarchy song let's not I think you're absolutely right in terms of it would be good if we didn't have to just do this self-care but I think whilst we're in it and we're making change we still need to be doing self-care so your point is absolutely right what's happening is wrong we shouldn't be in professions that are causing burnout, that are causing us to, you know, get incredibly stressed, incredibly anxious, incredibly upset and take it home with us constantly, continuously and ruminate over it. So I think there is a need for self-care and there is a need for resilience right now until we can grow in strength and start making the changes that are positive. So for me, that's where I see self-care coming in. So, Katie, how do we do self-care? That's the bullet point. How do you do self-care? Well, 
I I love self-care. I mean, I'm completely selfish and it's all about me, me, me. Um, I think for me, self-care is I have a meditation practice and I've been doing that maybe for about five years, uh, different types of meditation. Um, I find that really helpful, but I find the best way to meditate and just to really clear my head and my thoughts is to be in nature and be in the forest. And, you know, there's actually really good evidence about it actually reduces your cortisol levels and regulates our blood pressure, among other things. So forest bathing has been this big fashionable term that's come about or actually Shinrin Yuku. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong from Japan, but just being with nature, with the forest, whether you live in a city or not, and just taking that time to wander. And I think the other thing is take your bloody earphones out. If you're walking in nature, you should not be listening to this podcast. Um, <laughs> Listen to the sounds of nature. Say that. I can say that because they can listen to it at other times. Listen to it when they're going in the car or they're walking, <laughs> but not in nature. You need to hear nature. You can hear nature in the podcast. You can hear my guinea fowl roosting. You can hear Eddie going off the cicadas because I'm in a jungle, you know. Put that on the Christmas album. Just the sounds of Rachel's nature for self-care. It will be the self-care album. <gasps> I've got two albums. Brilliant. And I'm in Switzerland, so all you hear is cowbells. No, but we could because because you, you can get entire things that are just like sounds of nature. I should yeah, just no. stick this microphone outside. I'm not sure the guinea fowl would be particularly relaxing. Listen to <laughs> it. Brilliant. We'll make that album. Brilliant. Anyway, carry on. So you, we're meditating. We're walking about in nature. You say it like it's not without earphones. power and importance. It has got power and importance. I'm it's not, really... I'm, I'm reiterating <laughs> All right. because the listeners will get lost with our conversation and song. So I'm reiterating what you said. All right. Thank you. Um, so for me, that is incredibly important. And just making sure you have some time to actually be quiet. And, you know, how many times do we ever sit with a cup of tea or whatever without looking at your phone or the TV or reading something? and you just sit for five or 10 minutes, or just concentrate on your breath. Um, and mm. these things are really, really important. And I'm going to ask you, Rachel, how you find doing these things? Because I think you are very different to me. Because you're being mean. I'm not being mean. I'm just, I well, think it's good to have a balance here on the podcast, because there will be a lot of people like you and a lot of people like me. And we're both extremes, obviously. Well, I would love to be able to meditate. Um, and I do every now and then try. And then I just get annoyed. Because, and so look, I have done three, I have done three days by myself in a forest, thanks mm. to Jane Hardwick Collins, with nothing, like nothing to read or look at, just no food, three days yeah. and three nights. And my brain did not shut up. It doesn't stop. It just, it was just, it, all that happened was my brain went excellent. Now we've just got absolute free flow. So off it goes. And in the end, I just had to kind of go, all right. It's like when I go, when I go for runs, like, so I'd like not run toilet runs. When I go for trot stumbles through the forest, which is what I call my trot kind of walk, stumbles. trot stumble thing that I do. <laughs> Rachel horse. Because I never run, I trot rather than run is I go out and I'm not going out for a trot stumble for exercise. I'm going out for a trot stumble because then my brain just, it's yeah. like letting the dog off the lead. <laughs> and sometimes it comes back with a good ball or two. <laughs> so I find um, meditation really, di and I know everyone goes, it's not about not thinking. It's not about not, it's like, all right, all right. But I just don't ever get to that. I just get irritated by it. You have a good yoga practice. Yeah, I do yoga most days because then I have to think a bit about doing stuff, which then stops me from thinking about doing other things because otherwise I fall over. Do you not think that that's a meditative practice? Yeah, I suppose it is. Yeah. So you meditate fairly regularly on a daily basis and you well, have trot stumbles, which is also a type of switching up your brain. <laughs> so it's thinking differently. It's changing your hormones in your body and it's putting you in nature and it is a part of self-care. 
that you have as a regular practice, you have been doing this for years. And that is the way that your brain and your body copes. And the other thing I do is pottering. I thought you can say pottery. I was like, what? Don't tell me you've taken up my old, my old nope, skill. No, pottery. no uh, pottering. Oh, yeah. Love that. Just bumbling about the house, watering plants and things. Yeah. Tidying, just mindfulness. organizing stuff. I love cleaning things out and organizing. Oh, my God. Like, it's usually dark moon or it's just before I bleed. And I just go on this big purge and I just chuck stuff out and clean things like now to the point where it's actually not good because I actually don't have enough clothes because I've chucked them all out and I've only got, you know. You're buying them back from the same <laughs> charity shop that you gave them to. Right. You might actually be laughing, but that is actually true because they're in Yandina. <laughs> so, <laughs> have you, was I with you once where you bought a skirt and you went, oh, I love this. And it was actually something that you had given to them and it was your skirt that you picked up. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I do it all the time with my daughter. She'll turn up and I go, oh, I like your card again. And she goes, no, you can't have it. It was yours and you gave it to me. You gave it to me now. Because it's... you've forgotten. You're like, oh, that's lush. But that's therapeutic. There you go. It's yeah. therapy. Go, oh, that's nice. And I want it back. You have your therapy. And that's the point. Yeah, you've got to find what works for you. I mean, I've got a colleague who like runs like 100 Ks, like because she's completely nuts. But that's her self care. You know, I'd rather put a fire out with my face. But anyway, <laughs> that's <who laughs> I, I might do. join so you. I I couldn't drive that far without whinging. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that's such a good point. <laughs> so the message is: find out what works for you and do it regularly simple you've heard it everywhere self-care. we're not saying anything new we'll put on a workshop about self-care shall we um yeah i'd love to do that come and forest bathe in switzerland oh it's lush all right should we do the last bit which is about solidarity yes let's do the that last be a song bit. as well solidarity so solidarity finding your tribe so it's about finding because, you know, you might think you're unique and that you're a bit weird and nobody else feels the same as you. But look at me and Rachel. We found each other. <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm the same as you, Kate. But you're in me tribe, pet. That's what I meant. We're not the same, but we're in the tribe. Yeah, right. So it's finding those people, connecting with them and building solidarity. And actually, Marilyn French... Mm. writes a little section about solidarity which is really interesting because it's true saying that you know women have not had kind of formalized solidarity for generations and generations because it's been disrupted because it's dangerous you know to 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 meet covertly to men to have women building solidarity is dangerous yeah so we maintained a bit of solidarity in the collective culture of women at birth in the middle ages and that's even been disrupted now so we're not good at it and women are not good at it and we internalize all that misogyny and oppression and we turn it on each other so we start to police each other and we start to judge and you know bitch and pull each other down which is just acting like an oppressed group yes which is counterproductive because we need to be building solidarity having each other's backs absolutely right I think it just creates more and more of that, you know, we talk about toxic environments and it just sort of propagates itself. The more we discuss it, the more we ruminate on it, the more we focus just on this, the negative areas when actually we should be sort of standing in our tribe and, and we trying to lift each other up or support each other and also seeing, seeing the good parts of what we do on a day-to-day basis and pointing them out for your colleagues as well. Yeah. And I think that's really important pointing them out. You know, we're very good at, because we've been kind of socialized to, to do this. We're very good at um, judging other people and pointing out when people do it wrong. And I think at the moment, the birth world is rife with women judging other women, Mm. different kinds of birth workers, judging different kinds of birth workers, policing each other, you Mm. know, what we do and what we say that's rife and, We need to change that. We need to actually build some solidarity, which means on a big scale and on a small scale, you know, on a big scale, supporting each other, but also on a smaller scale. You know, if you are 
you attend a birth with a midwife, you know, and she does something really lovely after tell her that, you know, quick, you know, risk management is all about let's debrief a bad thing. How about also debriefing a good thing? You know, just saying to that midwife, oh my God, when you said that to her, it totally changed the atmosphere in the room and that, you know, got her through that bit. I really liked what you did there. You know, just simple things like that, which we forget. Whereas we're very quick to say, oh, you should have done this or you should have done that. Yeah. It makes me feel absolutely wonderful when I get those, that feedback. And I know I've seen the difference it's made in someone else. And sometimes it's just one sentence someone said to you, it has changed your entire framework for the whole day. And it's put what may have started Mm -hmm. out as a really difficult or shitty day. And you've, and literally when you say that's made my day, it has and it's just something you can keep touching back on and going, do you know what? That's, I'm going to hold on to that. That is a little piece of, it's a present. So, you know, just saying thank, I mean, I've started actually contacting people to say thank you when I read something really great that they've read, uh, that they've written, or, you know, something they've done just saying thank you that, you know, yeah. because they've done something really positive yeah. for the cause, which is to shift, you know, maternity care back towards women. And I got... um a lovely gift yesterday. I was absolutely tearing my hair out. I'm really like busy and stressed at the moment. And, you know, I've got lots of things going on and I'd spent days reformatting 600 bloody references. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then anyway, I was just kind of at the point of like, what do I do all this for? You know, I'm sick of this. What's the point? Rah, rah, rah. And then you got a lovely message from a doula who just said, oh, by the way, you know, just wanted to thank you for everything that you do, blah, blah, blah. You know, sent some women to you your um blog site and you know it's really helped them make informed decisions and just this lovely like thank you and it's like oh so so thank you for that that's just what I needed to hear today yeah Yeah. and it's not about the thank yous but it's a it is all of that package of let's let's continue this sort of positive vibe as much as we can because there's a lot of us in this field that have days when we really struggle and wonder whether there is a point to it and whether we should continue going. And that's what keeps us in it. It's about saying to someone, I see you. I see what you're doing. Yes. Thank you. I think that's probably a really nice place to stop because we're not ranting and we feel calm (laughs) because we've just (laughs) talked about the, um, it's, it's rounded it up nicely, I think. It has. It's done the shit sandwich. Like start with a bit of nice bit, like ranty pants shit in the middle and then end with a nice bit. Exactly. So that's it. The end of part two, navigating the system. You asked for it. We delivered. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. uh, Despite the um, craziness of recording with a six to seven second delay that had to be edited all of the nature sounds the singing the um, getting frustrated with notes along the way but i am glad you stuck with us and i just want to say a huge thank you for all of your followings and your shares keep them coming because they warm our cockles and getting those reviews and ratings on apple itunes and wherever you get your podcasts really helps us to grow our reach and get more ideas stay tuned we've got lots of interviews coming up over the christmas period and we will be giving you some delicious episodes very soon there we have it right i'm looking at the bullet point list here and it says how do we do self-care katie that's your bullet point and says can KJ ask RR about how she can't meditate question mark is that a question mark what's that for that's did you add that in yeah you've been fiddling with the notes when three days ago well I haven't looked at them since then oh, you should do your bloody you know preparation and it's been really hard with this delay god knows what's going to happen with this recording might start now might take me four weeks <laughs> two hours a day it's meant to be fun, Katie. It's meant to be fun. I can't even see you. I can just see the rims of your glasses glinting in the light. Because it's night time. Um, lights, electricity. I've got a bloody light on. Oh, I cannot see, man. <laughs>